Gershom, the Shulams. Major trends in Jewish mysticism. Continuing the Zohar II, the Theosophic Doctrine. We were looking at that the other day. The simile of the man is often used as that of the tree. The biblical word that man was created in the image of God means two things to the Kabbalist. First, that the power of the Sephiroth, the paradigm of divine life, exists and is active in man. Secondly, that the world of the Sephiroth, that is to say, the world of God, the Creator, is capable of being visualized under the image of man, the Created. From this it follows that the limbs of the human body, to repeat the instance I have already given, are nothing but images of a certain spiritual mode of existence which manifests itself in the symbolic figure of Adam Padman, the primordial man. For to repeat, the divine being himself cannot be expressed. All that can be expressed are his symbols. The relation between Ain Sof and its mystical qualities, the Sephiroth, is compared to that between the soul and the body, but with the difference that the human body and the soul differ in nature, one being material and the other spiritual, while in the organic whole of God all spheres are substantially the same. Nevertheless, the question of the essence and substance of the Sephiroth, which which the Zohar itself is not concerned, subsequently became to theosophical Kabbalism a special problem whose consideration we must forego here. The conception of God as an organism had the advantage of answering the question why there are different manifestations of the divine power, oh, the divine being is an absolute whole, for it is not the organic life of the soul one and the same, although the function of the hands differs from that of the eyes and so on. Incidentally, the conception of the Sephiroth as parts or limbs of the mystical anthropos leads to an anatomical symbolism, which does not shrink from the most extravagant conclusions. Thus, for instance, the con concept of the various aspects of the beard worn by the most ancient one is stated to be symbolical of varying shades of God's compassion. The Idra Rabba is almost entirely devoted to a most radical symbolism of this kind. Our, who's it, Rob Scallion, the guy who uh, plays the weird instruments but is really good at guitar. Um, the beard's like a symbolism of being really good at stuff, I guess, or being like the sage or master or something, you know. Like the guy goes up on the hill and comes back with a fake beard. And, uh, <laughs> side by side with this organic symbolism, other ways a symbolical expression present themselves to, to the theosophist who is concerned to describe the realm of divinity the world of the Sephiroth is the hidden world of language. The world of divine names, the Sephiroth, are the created names which God called into the world. The names which he gives to himself, which are of course the most important things to refer to God with. The action and development of that mysterious force, which is the seed of all creation, is, according to the Zohar's interpretation of the scriptural testimony, none other than speech. God spoke this speech is a force which at the beginning of creative thought was separated from the secret of Ein Sof, the process of life in God can be construed as the unfolding of the elements in, of speech. This is indeed one of the Zohar's favorite symbols. The world of divine emanation is one in which the faculty of speech is anticipated in God varying stages of the Sephiroth universe represent, according to the Zohar, the abysmal will, thought, inner and inaudible word, an audible voice, uh, oh, audible voice and speech, i.e. articulated and differentiated expression. The same conception of progressive differentiation is inherent in other symbols, of which I should like to mention only one, that of the I, you, and he, 
God in the most deeply hidden of his manifestations when he is called as it were just decided to launch upon his work of creation is called he God in the complete unfolding of his being grace and love in which he becomes capable of being perceived by reason of heart and therefore after being expressed is called you but God in this supreme manifestation where the fullness of his being finds its final expression in the last and all embracing of his attributes is called I this is the stage of true individuation in which God as a person says I to himself this divine self this I according to the theosophical papalist and this is one of their most profound and important doctrines is the Shekinah the presence and eminence of God in the whole of creation it is the point where man in attaining the deepest understanding of his own self becomes aware of the presence of God and only from there standing as it were at the gate of the divine realm does he progress into the deeper regions of the divine into his you and he and into the depths of nothing to gauge the degree of paradox implied by these remarkable and very influential thoughts one must remember that in general the mystics in speaking of god's eminence in his creation are inclined to depersonalize him the eminent god only too easily becomes an impersonal godhead in fact this tendency has always been one of the main pitfalls of pantheism all the more remarkable is that the Kabbalist, and even those among them who were inclined to pantheism managed to avoid it for as we have seen the zohar identifies the highest development of god's personality with precisely that stage of his unfolding which is nearest to human experience indeed which is eminent and mysteriously present in every one of us for among the symbolical descriptions of the unfolding of god and his revelation special attention must be given to that which is based on the concept of the mystical nothing to the Kabbalists, the fundamental fact of creation takes place in god apart from that he admits of no act of creation worth that name which might be conceived as fundamentally different from the first and most act and which takes place outside the wor world of the sephiroth the creation of the world that is to say the creation of something out of nothing is itself but the external aspect of something which takes place in god himself this is also a crisis of the hidden name Sof, who turns from repose to creation and it is this crisis creation and self-revelation in one which constitutes the great mystery of theosophy and the crucial point for the understanding of the purpose of theosophical speculation the crisis can be pictured as the breakthrough of the primordial will but theosophic capitalism frequently employs bolder the bolder metaphor of nothing the primary start or wrench in which the introspective um startled by a dog there The primary start, our wrench, in which the introspective God is externalized and the light that shines inwardly made visible, the revolution of perspective transforms a soft, inexpressible fullness into nothingness. It is this mystical nothingness from which all the other stages of God's gradual unfolding and the Sephiroth emanate, and which the Kabbalists call the highest Sephiroth, or the supreme crown of infinity. To use another metaphor, it is a this which becomes visible in the gaps of existence. Some Kabbalists who have developed this idea, for instance, Rabbi Joseph ben Shalom of Barcelona, 1300, maintain that in every transformation of reality, in every change of form, or every time, the status of a thing is altered. The abyss of nothingness is crossed, and for a fleeting mystical moment becomes visible. Nothing can change without becoming without coming into contact with this region a pure absolute being which the mystics call nothing the difficult task of describing the emergence of the other sephiroth from the womb of the first the nothing is somehow managed with the aid of copious metaphors in this connection it may be of interest to examine a mystical jew de Mots, which comes very close to the ideas of the zohar and was already used by joseph Gikatilla, the Hebrew word for nothing, Ain, has the same consonants as the word for I, Ani, and as we have seen, God's I is conceived as the final stage in the emanation of the Sephiroth, that stage in which God's personality in a simultaneous gathering together of all its previous stages reveals itself to its own creation. In other words, the passage from Ain to Ani is symbolical of the transformation by which the nothing passes through the progressive manifestations of its existence in the Sephiroth into the eye uh 
dialectical process whose thesis and antithesis begin and end in God. Surely a remarkable instance of dialectical thought. And you can also point out some ancient Egyptian um, connections to that. Here, as elsewhere, mysticism intent on formulating the paradoxes of religious experience uses the instrument of dialectics to express its meaning. The Kabbalists are by no means the only witnesses to this affinity between mystical and dialectical thinking. In the Zohar, as well as in the Hebrew writings of Moses de Leon, the transformation of nothing into being is frequently explained by the use of one particular symbol, that at the primordial point. Already the Kabbalist of the Geronese school employed the comparison with the mathematical point whose motion creates the line and the surface to illustrate the process of emanation from the hidden cause. To this comparison, Moses de Leon adds the symbolism of the point as the center of the circle. The primordial point from nothing is the mystical center around which the theogon the, the theogonical process is crystallized, itself without dimensions, and, as it were, placed between nothing and being. The point serves to illustrate what the Kabbalist of the 13th century of the Common Era called the origin of being, that beginning of which the first word of the Bible speaks, the somewhat pompous phrases in which the opening lines of the Zohar's interpretation of the story of creation describes this emergence of the primordial point, not indeed from the nothing, as remarked in another context, but from the ethereal aura of God, can serve as an example of the mystical imagery of the whole book. In the beginning, when the will of the king began to take effect, he engraved signs into the divine aura, a dark flame sprang forth, from the inmost recesses of the mystery of the infinite Ain Sof, like a fog which forms out of the formless, enclosed in the ring of this aura, neither white nor black, neither red nor green, and of no color whatever. But when this flame began to assume size and extension, it produced radiant colors. For in the innermost center of the flame, a well sprang forth, from which flames poured on everything below, hidden in the mysterious secrets of Ain Sof, the wall broke through, and yet did not entirely break through. The ethereal aura which surrounded it, it was entirely unrecognizable until, under the impact of its breakthrough, a hidden supernal point shone forth. Beyond this point, nothing may be known or understood, and therefore it is called Rashit, that is, beginning, the first word of creation. By the Zohar, as the majority of the other Kabbalistic writers this primordial point is identified with the wisdom of God, Hokma. God's wisdom represents the ideal thought of creation conceived as the ideal point which itself springs from the impulses of the abysmal will. The author extends the comparison by liking it to the mystical seed which is sown into creation, the point of comparison apparently being not only the subtlety of both, but also the fact that in either the possibilities of further being are potentially, though as yet, invisibly existent. Insofar as God appears through the manifestation of the Chokmah, he is perceived as wise, and in his wisdom the ideal existence of all things is, as it were, enshrined. If, it's, if still undeveloped and undifferentiated, the essence of all that exists is nevertheless derived from God's Chokmah. Between this primordial mode of existence and God's thoughts and the concretest of reality, there is no second transition or crisis, no second creation from the uncreated in the theological sense. In the following Sephirah, the point develops into a palace or building, an allusion to the idea that from this Sephirah it is externalized. The building of the cosmos proceeds. What was hidden and was as it were folded up in the point is now unfolded. The name of the Sephirah, Bina can be taken to signify not only intelligence, but also that which divided between the things, i.e. differentiation. What was previously undifferentiated in the divine wisdom exists in the womb of the Bina, the supernal mother, as the pure totality of all individuation. In it, all forms are already performed, but still preserved in the unity of the divine intellect, which contemplates them in itself. The in the passage from the Zohar, which has been quoted above, the image of the point is already combined 
with the more dynamic one of the fountain which springs from the heart of the mystical nothing. In many places the primordial point is directly identified with this fountain from which all bliss and blessings flow. The mystical Eden, Eden meaning literally bliss or joy, and from here the stream of divine life takes its course and flows through all the Sephiroth and through all hidden reality until at last it falls into the great sea of the Shekinah in which God unfolds his totality. The seven Sephiroth which flow from the maternal womb of the Bena are the seven primeval days of creation. What appears in time as the epoch of actual and external creation is nothing but the projection of the archetypes of the seven lower Sephiroth which in timeless existence are enshrined in God's inwardness. One is tempted to apply to this hidden life of the Sephiroth in the relation to Ain Soth, Shelley's lines. Life is like a dome of many colored glass, stains the white radiance of eternity. It is true that this supreme entity which springs out of nothing this entity in God, the substance of divine wisdom, lies beyond the horizon of human experience. It cannot be questioned or even visualized. It precedes the division between the subject and the object of consciousness, without which there is no intellectual cognition, that is to say, no knowledge. In describing this division of the divine consciousness, the Zohar, in one of its profoundest symbolisms, speaks of it as a manifestation of God's progressive unfolding. Among the manifestations of God, there is one for several reasons. The Kabbalists identify it with Bina, the divine intelligence in which he appears as the eternal subject, using the term in its grammatical sense as the great who. Me. Me. Who stands at the end of every question and every answer. Me. Yeah. This is M-I. So uh, a great thought. A, 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 a thought which suggests the idea of an apotheosis of the well-known Jewish penchant for putting questions. There are certain spheres of divinity where questions can be asked and answers obtained, namely the spheres of this and that, of all those attributes of God which the Zohar symbolically calls Aleh, i.e. the determinable world. Alu is a word for God. Um, you know, with or without the wow. Meaning, you know, the power. That's a power because of itself, right? Um, or at least one that's referred to as such. Um, I have the determinable world. In the end, however, meditation reaches a point where it is still possible to question who, but no longer possible to get an answer. Rather does the question itself constitute an answer. And if the domain of me, am I, of the great who in which God appears as the subject of the mundane process, can at least be questioned. The higher sphere of divine wisdom represents something positive beyond the reach of questioning, something which cannot even be visualized in abstract thought. This idea is expressed in a profound symbol, the Zohar, and indeed the majority of the older Kabbalists question the meaning of the first verse of the Torah, Bereshith bara Elohim, in the beginning, created God. Or you could say, Abrashit bara Elohim, um, the father of the beginning. The evolving was of divinity. It's not saying that in the beginning created God. Um, that's not really an accurate way to translate that phrase, regardless of whether you had the Aleph in the front or not. What, but what does this actually mean? The answer is fairly surprising. We are told that it means Bereshit through the meeting, uh, the medium of the beginning, i.e of the primordial existence which has been identified as the wisdom of God bara created that is to say the hidden nothing which constitutes the grammatical subject of the word bara emanated or unfolded Elohim that is to say its emanation is Elohim it is the object and not the subject of the sentence and what is Elohim 
Elohim is the name of God, which guarantees the continued existence of creation insofar as it represents the union of the hidden subject, me, and the hidden object, Eleh, M-I-E-L-E-H. The Hebrew words meh and Eleh have the same constants as the complete word Elohim. So, yeah, it would be pronounced me and Al. In other words, Elohim is the name given to God after the disjunction of subject and object has taken place, but in which gap is continuously bridged or closed. The mystical nothing which lies before the division of the primary idea into the knower and the known is not regarded by the Kabbalist as a true subject. The lower ranges of God's manifestation form the object of steady human contemplation, but the highest plane which meditation can reach at all, namely the knowledge of God, as the mystical me, who, as the subject of the mundane process, this knowledge can be no more than an occasional and intuitive flash which illuminates the human heart as sunbeams play on the surface of water to use Moses de Leon's metaphor. Uh, part 5. These are only a few instances of the method by which the author of the Zohar seeks to describe in symbolical terms the theosophical universe of God's hidden life. At this point, we are faced with the problem of the world outside the Sephiroth, or in other words, that the creation in the narrower sense and its relations to God, a problem involving that of pantheism in the history of Kabbalism Theistic and pantheistic trends have frequently contended for mastery. This fact is sometimes obscured because the representatives of pantheism have generally endeavored to speak the language of theism. Cases of writers who openly put forward pantheistic views are rare. Most of the text, and in particular the classical writings of the theosophic school, contain elements of both tendencies. The author of the Zohar inclines towards pantheism, a fact made even clearer by the Hebrew writings of Moses de Leon, but one would look in vain for confession of his faith beyond some vague formula and hints at a fundamental unity of all things, stages, and worlds. On the whole, his language is that of the theist, and some penetration is needed to lift its hidden and lambent pantheistic core to the light. We read in one passage, the process of creation, too, has taken place on two planes, one above and one below. And for this reason, the Torah begins with the letter Beth, the numerical value of which is two, the lower occurrence, corresponds to the higher one produced in the upper world of the Sephiroth, the other of the netherworld of the visible creation. In other words, the work of creation is described in the first chapter of Genesis has a twofold character insofar as it represents in a mystical sense, the history of God's self-revelation and his unfolding in the life of the Sephiroth. The description is theogony. It is difficult to find a more suitable term for all its mythological connotations and only in so far as it brings the netherworld into being, i.e. creation in the strict sense of a prosio di ad extra. Sorry about my shoes. Um... As the scholastic definition goes, it can, can it be described as cosmogony? Both differ, as we are told, in the continuation of the both quoted passage, only in that the higher order represents the dynamic unity of God, while the lower leaves room for differentiation and separation. For the description of this lower realm, the Zohar favors the term Alma de Peruda, the world of separation. Here there exist things which are isolated from each other and from God, but at this point the pantheistic tendency comes to the surface, to the eye which penetrates more deeply. This isolation, too, is only apparent. If one contemplates the things in mystical meditation, everything is revealed as one. Ardi Gikatila has the formula. He fills everything, and he is everything. Theogony and cosmogony represents not two different acts of creation, but two aspects of the same. On every plane in the world of the Merkabah and the angels, which is below the Sephiroth, in the various heavens and in the world of the four elements, creation mirrors the inner movement of the divine life. The vestiges of the innermost reality 
are present even in the most external of things. Everywhere there is the same rhythm, the same motion of the waves, the act which results beyond and above time in the transformation of the hidden into the manifest God. It's paralleled in the time-bound reality of every other world. Creation is nothing but an external development of those forces which are active and alive in God himself. Nowhere is there a break, a discontinuity from the light of the Shekinah. This is not a creatio ex nihilo, which at this stage would no longer be a mystical metaphor. The most frequent illustration of this doctrine to be found in Moses de Leon's Hebrew writings is that of the chain and the link of which it consists. There are in this chain the links of which are represented by the totality of the different worlds, different grades of links, some deeply hidden and others visible from outside. But there is no such thing as isolated existence. Everything is linked with everything else down to the lowest ring on the chain. And the true essence of God is above as well as below, in the heavens and on the earth. And nothing exists outside him. And this is what the sages mean when they say, When God gave the Torah to Israel, he opened the seven heavens to them, and they saw that nothing was there in reality but his glory. He opened the seven worlds to them, and they saw that nothing was there but his glory. He opened the seven abysses before their eyes, and they saw that nothing was there but his glory. Meditate on these things, and you will understand that God's essence is linked and connected with all worlds and that all forms of existence are linked and connected with each other, but derived from his existence and essence. The pantheistic side of this conception has its limits and can be shelved altogether if necessary. All created existence has a certain kind of reality to itself, in which it appears independent of these mystical worlds of unity. But in the sight of the mystic, the separate outlines of things become blurred until they too represent nothing. But the glory of God and his hidden life, which pulsates in everything. It is true that this is not all, as we shall see further on. This limited and isolated existence of separate things is not really a primary and essential component of the divine scheme of creation. Originally, everything was conceived as one great whole, and the life of the Creator pulsated without hindrance or disguise in that of his creatures. Everything stood in direct mystical report with everything else, and its unity could have apprehended directly and without the help of symbols. Only the fall has caused God to become transcendent. Its cosmic results have led to a loss of the original harmonious union and to the appearance of an isolated existence of things. All creation was originally of a spiritual nature, and but for the intervention of evil would not have assumed material form. No wonder that where the Kabbalists of this school describe the state of the messianic world and the blissful knowledge of the devotee in a world purged of its blemish, the emphasis is on the restoration of the original coexistence and correlation of all things. What is at present reserved to the mystic whose gaze penetrates through the outer shell to the core of the matter will anon be the common property of mankind in the state of redemption. It is true that despite this multiformity of stages and manifestations, the theosophist tries to maintain the unity of God and to avoid the danger of postulating a plurality. Theoretically, he manages this frequently with the aid of the philosophical formula that the semblance of a difference between man, uh, but, uh, a difference between God's compassion, wrath, etc. exists only in the mind, but not in the objective reality of God's existence. In other words, the appearance of a multitude of manifestations is due to the existence of a medium, the finite creature which perceives the divine light in his own way. However, it is possible to escape from the fact that such a formula, ingenious as they are, do not entirely correspond to the essence of the particular religious feeling, which has found its expression in the doctrine of the Sephirah. Um, so that passage in the Bible, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, that, that thing, really translates as, as the medium. and But the medium is something other than God, is, is the implication as we're seeing here, um, without reference to that. 
As I have said previously, these symbolically conceived spheres of God are more than attributes of theology, are the meditations and hypostasis which Plotinus, in his doctrine of emanation, interposed between the absolute and the phenomenal world. The Sephiroth of Jewish theosophy have an existence of their own. They form combinations, they illuminate each other, they ascend and descend, they are far from being static. Although each has its ideal place in the hierarchy, the lowest can, under a certain aspect, appear as the highest. In other words, what we have here is something like a real process of life in God, the fluctuations of which the theosophist perceives, if his experience can be called perception. The organ of perception being, so to speak, the heart. To reconcile this process with the monotheistic doctrine, which was as dear to the Kabbalist as it was to every Jew, became the task of the theorists of Kabbalistic theosophy. Although they applied themselves bravely to it, it cannot be said that they were completely successful. Even the most grandiose efforts to establish a complete synthesis, like the one made by Moses Cordovero of Safed, left an indissoluble remainder which defied rationalization. It is impossible to avoid the conclusion that the problem was far from being insoluble, that mysticism originally perceived an aspect of God which is beyond rationality and which becomes paradoxical the moment it is put into words. The author of the Zohar seldom makes a direct approach to the problem. The theosophic world of the Sephiroth is so real to him as to be, according to him, perceptible in almost every word of the Bible. The symbols and images which serve to describe it are, after all, more than metaphors to him. He is not simply a mystic who hunts for expressions to describe his irrational experience. He is that too, and that the origin of the mystical symbol described by E. Risa Jack in his essay on the basis of mystical knowledge, 1889, can be traced to many a striking